Hi, Pastor Anthony here. At Vintage Faith Church, we stand behind the Bible's claim to be the Word of God, and we believe that the Scriptures contain everything needed for life and godliness. The Scriptures testify to the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We pray that this recording stirs your faith towards that end. This is in no way meant to be a substitute for the local church gathering, which we believe is critical to your growth as a Christian and your walk with Christ. We pray that you will find the sermon edifying and challenging. Thank you for listening. So if you were with us, uh, and I know many of you weren't, but four years ago we preached through Genesis 1 to 11. Um, Genesis 1 to 11 is often called the primeval history. It, it reads different than the rest of Genesis. Um, to give you an idea, Genesis 1 to 11, uh, depending on how you, you slice it and where you start, but it, it's roughly um, considered to be about a 2,000-year time span, um, from 1 to, to up and to the point that the Tower of Babel, which we, we just read after the Babel. Genesis 12, which is really where this sermon series starts, to Genesis 22, so we're looking at how, how many chapters is that? I'm thinking 10, but is it 11? But you can do the math. Um, that is 25 years. So, so think about that for a moment. Genesis 1 to 11. Genesis 1 to 11, 11 chapters covering roughly 2,000 years. And then um, the next 10 chapters are, are very, very focused um, on this man uh, that we're going to begin talking about today, but really dig into next week, Abraham. When the Bible slows down like this, we have to take notice. So for, for you students of the Bible and, and, and for, for, for maybe some of you who are new to it, if you're picking up the Bible and you're reading it, um, it is going to move very quickly and then it's going to slow down. And when it does that, we have to take notice. Furthermore, in the book of Genesis, um, it is the beginning of the signposts um, of genealogy. So we just read a genealogy, and I, I can imagine some of you um, might have been thinking, why is he reading this? Um, but the genealogies um, all throughout the Bible are very important. We're going to look at that today and why they're important. But one of the reasons they are important is this. They are signpost, usually, not always, for a covenant and a covenant Head. What do I mean by that? Well, if you read Genesis 1 and you get to chapter 5, you're going to see a genealogy from Adam, and it's going to end with Noah. And Genesis 6, 7, 8, and 9 are all about Noah. Noah and the covenant that God made with through Noah. If you keep reading the Bible... You're going to get where we just got to. You have a long genealogy, which I just read. It ended with basically Abraham, Abram, for just for um, Abram's name changes, but I'm going to use his name Abraham throughout this series. It ended with Abraham, and you're going to have 10 chapters. Actually, really, the rest of Genesis is dealing with Abraham and his family and the covenant made with Abraham. You keep reading the Bible, it's moving along in the story, and you get to the book of Ruth, and Ruth tells a beautiful story, but at the end of Ruth, you're going to see another genealogy that starts with one of Abraham's great-grandsons, Perez, and ends with David. The next two books, First and Second Samuel, are all about David and the covenant that God made with David. You keep reading the Bible, you're going to be reading some history and the prophets, and then you're going to come to Matthew. And Matthew starts out with a very long genealogy, starting with Abraham, going all the way to Jesus, and then you have four books on Jesus and the new covenant. Covenants are a way to think through the unity of the scripture. God is doing something through these covenants. Um, and so the, the, this series is we're going to be looking at Abraham. You're going to also be looking at God's covenant with Abraham and why that matters. The book of Genesis is historical. However, it does not read like we read historical books. 
Um, it, it certainly is recording history, but it's not answering the questions that, that we in our modern um, minds are asking. Like, how does who marries who? Uh, what, what, why is this not in the right order? And it, it's not meant to give us a chronological, historical um, view of things. The book of Genesis is concerned with questions like this. How did we get here? How did we get here? If you, if you know God, you know Christ, you have an answer to that, but most of humanity doesn't. Or they've come to another conclusion. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Right there. That, that's the, the point of, of, of the early chapters of Genesis. In the beginning, God it all starts with God. You want to know what all this, you know, the trees, the mountains, the oceans, all the birds, all of it, where is it from? It's from God, and in Genesis unpacks that. So how did we get here? And these are questions of identity. Who am I? The other question that, that I think Genesis speaks to, why are we here? Why are we here? Have you ever asked that question? What, what is my purpose? Why, why am I here? What am I to do with the, the years that the Lord gives me? Or maybe you're in here and you don't know the Lord. What am I to do with the years that, that I have? Maybe they're 30, maybe they're 60, maybe they're 80, maybe they're 90, but they're few. What do I do with that time? Genesis 1.28 is pretty clear about this. First of all, we're made in the image and likeness of God. You are made to represent God. 128, and it says, And God blessed them, Adam and Eve. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So why are we here? Are we here just to enjoy ourselves and have experiences and have fun? Well, well God has given us those things as gifts, but he's also given you a, a mandate to, um, to, to move upon the earth in a way that you are um, stewarding, that you're subduing. This is really work. doesn't mean that you necessarily get paid for it, but it's, it's work. You are made to, 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 to work to steward, to have dominion, to take dominion over creation. Steve did a wonderful job last week of connecting that to the Great Commission, and that's not um, part of this sermon, but that, that, in a sense, is, as Christians, what we are doing now. We are spreading, making disciples, multiplying, um, and increasing uh, God's image throughout the world. So why are we here? That's a question on every human being's Mind. What is it that's going to give me um, maximum satisfaction and contentment? Is it that next vacation? Is it um, pleasure? Um, what, what is it? And, and the Genesis speaks very clearly to that. The third question that Genesis speaks to is what went wrong? There's all sorts of ideas in the world today about what is wrong with the world, but one thing that all agree on is something is wrong. If you find someone that would deny that, you, you, you're not dealing with an honest intellectual um, person or argument. Something went wrong. Why am I unhappy at times and, and I don't even know why? What is the cause of my unhappiness? Why is my job so hard? Why does it, I feel like every time I make some kind of, um, um, a few steps forward, something happens and there's problems. Why is there so much conflict in my life? Why is there conflict in the world? Why do people die? Why am I insecure at times? What do I do with the tension that, the world is beautiful and life is beautiful, but at other times it seems utterly destructive and dark. How do I hold those two things in intention? Why do I long for something in this world that I've never actually felt or attained? 
And those are questions, again, any honest human being is, is asking those questions. And Genesis deals with those questions. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones says this of, of, of the book of Genesis. He says, and we have a feeling that we are, we're not meant for this. We don't like it. We want to be delivered from it. And he goes on to say that is ultimately the cause for all quests in the lives of men and women. We are all searching for some solution to the problems of life. Genesis speaks to this. The Bible speaks to this. In fact, the fourth question is, what is the solution? And this is the entire Bible. What is the solution to what we see, to what is in my heart, to what is in my mind, to what I see out there? What is the solution to all of this? And it's surprising the answer that is given. I'm not sure what you're thinking right now, what the solution is, but the the answer is given in seed form right in the beginning of Genesis. After Adam and Eve fall, they're, they're living in this perfect peace. And death hadn't entered the scene yet, so you can imagine... Um, what life is like, their, their bodies are, are, are perfect. And then all of a sudden they realize after they've, they've rebelled against God, they realize they're naked and they feel shame. So, so they're aware that, that they're unclothed. They're, that there's a loss of glory right away. There's a loss of something that, by the way, we, we don't typically experience. We know a world filled with guilt and shame. Even as Christians, you will struggle with these things. And in the midst of this horrific scene, God steps up and says the following. Genesis three fourteen to 15. The Lord God said to the serpent, so this is uh, the embodiment of evil, the devil. Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity, that that word just means hostility, between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So this is something that is the rest of the world would not agree with. The the Bible, God, Christianity's solution to what we see went wrong is a person. And we have it right here in Genesis 3. It's the offspring of Eve. And some kind of battle is going to ensue. But the, the answer... To everything we see that is not good, the darkness and the the sin and death and, and everything that came about because of Adam and Eve's disobedience, the answer is in a person. Okay, and we're going to see this all throughout our, our series in Genesis. The solution will be an offspring, a child from the line of Eve, uh, who will suffer a bruised heel in a battle. So this is You know, spoiler alert, this is Jesus. This is the cross, right? The bruised heel. Um, While he delivers a mortal head wound to the offspring of the serpent. So so again, this is uh, uh, in seed form. This is the promise of the gospel. And this promise begins to just unpack all throughout the Bible. It gets clearer and clearer uh, as the Bible progresses until we get to the Gospels and we see Jesus, and it's, oh, he is the son. He is the offspring. Um, One theologian says this, Satan in the world persist in their enmity toward Jesus and believers. The world hates Jesus and his people. Satan and the sinful leaders of this world put Jesus to death, striking his heel, But Jesus ultimately is victorious over the devil, striking his head, and overcomes the world. We, Christians, participate in this victory also as we overcome the world. So there's two aspects to to this promise, and they're going to play out in, in the life of Abraham. One is there is a collective 
seed or, or offspring, meaning many that are going to come from Abraham. And, and, and those offspring will be in this great battle and conflict um, between the offspring of, of the serpent and the offspring of Eve. Okay? And we, we see immediately in the story of Genesis 4, Cain and Abel, that, that it is not necessarily literal, physical offspring. Cain and Abel, two brothers of the same mom, immediately have conflict. Cain kills his brother, Abel, and we're not going to get, get into that. We're going to do kind of a flyover. But John in 1 John says Cain was of the evil one. Cain was of the offspring of the serpent. Okay, so Cain and Abel immediately, as the story progresses in Old Testament Israel, we have the prophet Ezekiel who's going to call Pharaoh part of the offspring of the serpent. Listen to this. Uh, Ezekiel says, Speak and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon. Okay, this is another name for the serpent. The great dragon that lies in the midst of his streams that says, My Nile is my own. I made it for myself. So here you have the prophet Ezekiel, and he is saying, Hey, this Pharaoh who oppressed the people of God, he is of the seed of the serpent. And interestingly enough, if you know anything about history, the, the Egyptian pharaohs and kings would wear a cobra headdress with a cobra on it, and it looked, um, it all just looked like a, a snake. And that's, um, I don't think that's an accident. Okay, not that they knew they were of the serpent, it's just God's way of working. We see this in Old Testament Israel when Assyria and the Philistines are constantly attacking God's people. Constantly attacking God's people. But it continues in the New Testament. Now it's not between nations. If you look at Revelation 12, 17. Then the dragon became furious with the woman. Okay, let's think again. Seed, seed, offspring, woman, dragon, woman, serpent. The dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. That is you. That is you. That is me. If you know Jesus, that is who the dragon went off to make war against. On those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. So this is, again, this, this, this offspring of the woman, this offspring of Eve, God's line and, and, and Satan's line. It continues. It runs throughout the entire Bible, and it continues even to this day. This is the persecuted church. This is the 21 Coptic Christians uh, 10, 15 years ago who were murdered on a beach. They're beheaded on a beach. This is um, even you when you share your faith, and everything is fine until you mention the name of Jesus. You can talk about God all you want, but you mentioned the name of the son of the woman, the son of the seed, the son of man, Jesus Christ, and everything changes. The whole conversation changes. That is because you are in the midst, and I am in the midst, of an epic battle that we can't even see between the seed of the woman, the offspring of the woman, and Eve, God's people, and the offspring of Satan um, those who are against God, those who reject God. When Jesus is having an interaction with the Pharisees, those who, who did not accept him, in Matthew 12, 34, what does he call them? He says, you brood of vipers. How can you speak good when you are evil? So he looks at the Pharisees who are rejecting him and says, you are offspring of the serpent. That's what he's saying here. He is bringing it all the way back to this, this promise in Genesis. You are offspring of the serpent. You brood of vipers. John 8, he does something similar 
same arguments, those who are trying to trap him. He says, you are of your father, the devil. You're of your father, the devil. You are offspring of the serpent. And again, this, this theme runs from Genesis to um, Revelation. And, and John and 1 John has a warning to, to Christians, another element that we, we need to, to be aware of. And he says, um, don't be like Cain, who was of the evil one. Don't be like Cain. So, so it is possible as Christians, because we are in the flesh, because we still have sin within us, that we at times can be like the offspring of the, the serpent instead of the offspring of of Eve. And John says, don't be like Cain. And that warning still stands to us today. And I would ask you this morning, in your life, think about just a week. Maybe you don't have to think about a week. Maybe it's just this morning. How have you gone about your life where you are imaging the serpent more than you're imaging the sun? And, and if you need me to flesh that out a bit, um, how about this? Uh, have you stretched the truth? Because he's a liar. Um, have you demanded justice? Because God, God, justice is the God is God's. Have you sought revenge? Have you manipulated? Have you taken what isn't yours? He's he's steals. Have you slandered people without the whole story? That's the enemy. How have you imaged the enemy, the seed or offspring? of the serpent more than Christ. And we all have to check our own heart here. So there is an epic battle going on. And if you were here two weeks ago, we talked about just this unseen realm of angels and demons, and it's playing out on earth. This epic battle between the two offsprings. But... This promise is more, and I will say more, it's not just, but it's more about one offspring. And as, as we were singing, we know how the story ends. I thought, you know, that's a pretty uh, apt song to sing during this sermon series because um, we are reading this story where, where they don't have the full revelation of Christ. Abraham doesn't have it. He saw the gospel, he saw Jesus, but he doesn't have what you have and I have. So we know how the story ends, and we, we are going to read through the early chapters of Genesis with that in mind. Play, praise God, what a blessing that we get to do that. So there is um, an element of this idea of the offspring of the woman that means one. I mean, if you're thinking Galatians, I don't have that in my in my sermon today, it'll come in probably next week, but, but Paul says when, when, when the promise came to Abraham that he would have offspring, it's not offsprings, it's offspring, meaning one, Jesus Christ. So that's the ultimate thrust of, of Genesis that we just read. I want to read um, from another theologian. He says this, the word seed or offspring. So you're going to hear me saying those two words interchangeably. The Hebrew word is zarah. It's sometimes translated offspring, sometimes seed. The word seed or offspring occurs 59 times in Genesis. The author of Genesis develops the unique family line, anticipating the serpent's defeat starting with Adam and Eve. The rest of Genesis will unfold the idea of this offspring and lay the foundation for the developed messianic teaching of the prophets. So let's bring another word into this, Messiah. When you read the prophets, you read this longing, this, this, this uh, heart cry for the Messiah to come. Well, the Messiah, it's just another word for offspring. It's all the same. So that the prophets are going back to Genesis, and they're saying this promise that we just read, this promise that, that all of this evil and death and disease and conflict is going to be reversed back, it's going to be rolled back, um, that's going to happen through a person. And that person is sometimes called the Son of God, sometimes called Messiah, 
anointed one, the deliverer, Jesus. So that is the story of the Bible. And and just to, to speak to this for a moment, often when I think we can get in trouble with reading the Bible, when things can get wonky and strange and you see people doing things that are that, that are like, hey, they're, they're claiming to be Christians and they somehow have the word, um, but that doesn't sound like uh, the Bible. And we, you've all heard experiences and seen that probably in some way. Things can get weird when you don't hold the story together. When it's from Genesis to Revelation, one story, and we know that even Jesus himself says it, it is about him. It is all about Jesus. When you lose Christ as the center, you're going to get into some weird things. You're going to get into to some weird things, and, and, and there's you know, lots of, of weird things that you can get into. So um, the, the Bible is one book, and I think to our detriment at times, we view the Old Testament Israel as one story and the church is another, and we forget that this is just crushing the biblical narrative. Um, it's all one story. Yes, God has moved differently. We have the Holy Spirit in a way that they didn't. We are not a country like them. Things are different. But we are still longing for the return of Christ, just like they were longing for Christ as well. We are still living in a, in a um, sin-scarred World, just like they were living in a sin-scarred world. We still lose people we love to death and disease, just like they lost people they loved to death and disease. We both have the same hope. We want evil to be rolled back, which includes death and all that comes with it. So early on in Genesis, right in chapter 4, we see this with Eve, this promise, and, and, and it's playing out with her. Um, she's looking for this call Messiah, this son, this offspring. Uh, now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Now you may have read this multiple times and said, I don't quite see that, Pastor. It seems like you're taking a leap, but... Um, Trust me, if you keep reading, this is, this is just hope. It's hope for the one, the, the person to come. Genesis 4.25, after the whole Cain and Abel episode, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another And here's our word, offspring. This word, again, 59 times in Genesis. God has appointed another offspring instead of Abel. And and you can almost hear the hope in her words. Maybe Seth. Eve's probably, I I don't know how this is going to work, but I know that God came on that horrific scene and he said to me and my husband, Adam, that he is going to, to give an offspring who will crush the head of this snake that just ruined everything. Maybe Seth is the one. And then we have in Genesis 5 this long genealogy. And seven gener- generations later, it gets to a man named Lamech, not the Lamech that you read in 4. This is a different Lamech. Um, and it goes like this, Genesis 5, 28 to 29. When, when Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah, saying, out of the ground that the Lord is cursed. So again, think about he's, he is specifically speaking to curse language, to, to the language that God cursed in Genesis 3. Out of the ground that the Lord is cursed, this one shall bring us relief. They're looking for a deliverer. Maybe it's Noah from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. This is really clear here. Lamech is saying, Noah, there's something special about this boy, Noah. I feel it. Maybe God had spoke to him. He knew something. God records his words. Maybe he is the one. Maybe he is the one to roll back death, to roll back conflict, sin, 
But we know, we know how the story ends. It was not Noah. But something was special about Noah. Something was special. In Genesis 6, 12, we have these words, And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on earth. So these words are a huge contrast to Genesis 1, when God saw all that he made and said it was very good. God was pleased. He, he pronounced a blessing over everything he made. And here we are, six chapters later, God says, it's corrupt. It's corrupt. All flesh had corrupted their way on earth. And we know the story. God wipes out all of humanity and he saves Noah and his family. He starts over. And if you're reading the narrative, you might be thinking, okay, maybe, maybe he's going to start over here and the world will be like it once was in Eden. But then we see very quickly, Noah finds himself in another garden, passed out drunk. And you begin to think, okay, well, this, this isn't it. This wasn't it. And you're left with the beginnings of thinking, okay, the problem with humanity is not something out there. It's something in the heart. And God wiped out all humanity. And Noah, his chosen vessel, still had sin in his own heart. So Noah was not the deliverer. The opening 11 chapters of Genesis reached their climax at the Tower of Babel. We just read that story at the Tower of Babel. Men and women who were made in the image of God and made in the likeness of God and given um, the charge to take dominion and to multiply and to spread out over the whole earth. They were given that charge. We see they decide to make a name for themselves and congregate. Let's read Genesis 11, 2 to 4 again. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top to the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. So again, here we are, after Noah, after the flood, after Noah's failure, just a few chapters later, men and women just disobeying God. And, and, and what are they doing? They're, they're all about their own glory. We're not going to do what you said to do, Lord. You told us to fill the earth. We're going to congregate in one place. And you heard the genealogy that ends with Abraham. So this is the beginning of, of all of our context for what we will begin um, next week. But just to, to kind of sum, sum it all up, Abraham comes on to the story after the tragic fall in the garden, a worldwide flood, and the curse of confusion and judgment of dispersion on all the nations. If you're reading Genesis 1 to 11 carefully, at this point, the story you are longing for, the hope that you are longing for, this return to Eden, you're losing all hope after Genesis 11. You're losing hope. And we're given another genealogy, which we read, and this time it's Noah's son, Shem. So again, the genealogy is unbroken from Adam to Seth to Noah to Shem. And then to Abraham's father, Terah. I'm going to read that again, Genesis 11, 26 to 32. When Terah had lived 70 years, he fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran fathered Lot. Lot's a a character that's going to come into the story. You're going to hear a lot about him. No pun intended. (laughs) 
Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred, in Ur of the Chaldeans, and Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and Iscah. And here's a really important sentence. Now, Sarai was barren. She had no child. So we're going to tuck that away. If you're a note taker, that's a big one right there. Sarah was barren. She had no child. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, so he's got a son, Haran, and there's a place, Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So Genesis 11 ends with the death of Abraham's father. Next week is going to begin with the call of Abraham. And you're going to be thinking as you go through next week and the weeks to come, the, the question that, that Moses, who is the author of Genesis, wants us to be thinking about, how will all the families of the earth be blessed in Abraham? That's, again, that's next week, kind of jumping forward. But how? That's, that's the question that Moses is kind of, he's prepping. He's getting us ready to, to either ask it or think about it. It's really the question we're left with at the end of Genesis, at the end of Deuteronomy, at the end of Joshua. It's what the prophets are all asking. It's what the prophets are proclaiming. Where, when, who, how will this offspring come? When is it going to happen? How is it going to happen? Who will he be? That, these, are, these are the questions that the entire canon of Scripture are are asking, is asking, all throughout the Bible, how is it going to be? And the prophets are just on repeat, just hammering this. And, and, and as, the, as Israel goes into exile and they, they, they lose their footing and lose their bearing and they're crying out for the Messiah, the offspring, the son to come. And one of the most clearest prophecies about who this offspring will be, we have um, just amazing clarity from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 9, 6, for to us a child is born. This is the offspring. This is, this is the Genesis promise. The child is born. A son is given. He's not only a child, he's going to be a son. And the government shall be on his shoulders. All the law, all of it will be on his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. So Isaiah's, okay, he's given us some information that, that we, it's been a little unclear. This, this offspring, this Messiah, this anointed one will be God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Brothers and sisters, we worship this child, this son. And as you know, his name is Jesus. As you know, as Isaiah clearly points out, he is more than a man, but he's not less than a man. He is mighty God. He is prince of peace. His rule and his reign will never end. We just sang, every knee one day will bow to this king. Everything in the Bible is pointing to him. He says it himself. He is the son that Eve longed for, that Lamech longed for, that Noah longed for, that Abraham longed for in Isaac, that Isaac longed for in Jacob. He is the son he is the son of David, the one that David thought maybe is Solomon. It is No, it is Jesus. He is the son, and he is the son of God. And we are like those Old Testament saints in that we are still waiting. He has come, and he has changed. He has um, disarmed the devil. The devil is, is disarmed, but the devil has not been done away with. Sin has not been done away with. Death has not been done away with. 
So we are much like our Old Testament brothers and sisters where we long for the return. We wait for the return of Christ. We just know who he is in a way they didn't. John says in 1 John, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. What are the works of the devil? All the death and destruction and, and, and darkness that we see, he is going to destroy those works. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we, just, we thank you. We thank you that you've not left us without revelation. Sometimes we concoct our own story, our own narratives of what we think this world is about. And Lord, we thank you that you have given us your word which corrects that, that, that really obliterates our own narratives. Lord, we, we live in this in-between time between your first and second coming and we have your Holy Spirit and we have a power available to us, but there is a day coming when this will all be changed. Help us to long for that day. Help us to sing about that day. Help us to, to be sure that our hope is in that day rather than anything in this world. Lord, we wait for you. We love you. You are king. You are savior. You are friend. Thank you. And we pray this all in your mighty name. Amen. Thanks for tuning in with us. We hope that you found this sermon edifying, encouraging, and challenging. To learn more about Vintage Faith Church, visit vintagefaithcicero.com. And of course, if you live in the area, we invite you to worship the Lord with us on Sunday mornings.